Personnel carries and troops, thousands of troops stationed opposite it. Uh, we've been hearing reports all day long that the troops may be ready to move now on Beijing University, which is some distance from Tiananmen Square in the northwestern part of that capital city. Uh, have you heard anything more about that recently? Well, students had expected some sort of uh, activity overnight and had prepared themselves. We were told they were trying to arm themselves as best they could with the rudimentary instruments with, with Molotov cocktails, but they do not have any real weapons to speak of. Uh, a lot of students, we are told, have uh, left the campuses and have gone into hiding either in the city or out into the countryside. Something is remarkable here. It's, it's just starting to happen. By bicycle, people are coming by twos and threes, maybe a dozen coming out to inspect the damage here. They are riding down to the last barricade uh, that was once the defense of the students. It's all burned out now. And they're staring out across at all these troops, thousands of troops. There's no sound. There's no confrontation from them. Disbelief, maybe, and certainly sadness, and certainly anger. All right, thank you very much. Keith Miller in Beijing tonight. We'll ask him to stand by to bring us up to date on any late developments. Many of you, in fact, as a result of the weekend, may just be catching up to the news of the assault on the square by those troops. It began Saturday night, Beijing time, and by the time the worst of it was over, the square was filled with dead and wounded. It is impossible to get an exact count. We've asked NBC's George Lewis to take us through this long, bloody battle. Tension had been building all day Saturday after some early skirmishes between students and soldiers. Anticipating a major attack, crowds began heading toward Tiananmen Square to reinforce the students who had been sitting there for three weeks. The number of soldiers ringing the square increased dramatically, thousands of them taking up positions in the center of town. Some of the demonstrators showed off the scars and bruises they had received in early encounters with the troops. This young man said that his face had been slashed by a soldier using the edge of his helmet as a weapon. Some of the students answered violence with violence. They pounced on this soldier dressed in plain clothes, one of a group they had been holding aboard a bus. They hauled him away from the bus and out of the view of cameras beat him severely. Some of the leaders of the democracy protest urged the crowd not to resort to violence, rather to continue sitting in the square peacefully. Ho De Jian, a well-known Chinese singer, one of those on a hunger strike. We protect ourselves. Yeah. We don't have guns, lives, or any weapons. But we, we must. We have to protect ourselves if they attack us. Nightfall Saturday, the soldiers' first attempt to enter the square. As they had on previous occasions, the students and their supporters massed around the convoys, blocking their movement. Some of the demonstrators tried to befriend the soldiers, saying that the people's army and the people should not be enemies. It was a short, peaceful interlude. In the early morning hours of Sunday, armored personnel carriers began to advance on the square, crashing through the barricades that the students had put up to protect themselves. The crowd quickly turned into an angry mob, attacking the armored vehicles with rocks, pipes, and Molotov cocktails. When one of the personnel carriers stalled, the crowd set it ablaze. Soldiers trying to flee the vehicle were clubbed. The army later claimed that the entire crew had been killed. There was a volley of tear gas. Then, without warning, the army opened up with bullets, firing indiscriminately at the crowd. They just killed another one in the square. Savages, savages, the crowd shouted at the soldiers. On the street, NBC News cameraman Brian Calvert and sound man John Hall found themselves caught right in the middle of the action.
few minutes later, a man popped up in front of Calvert's camera, a fuzzy silhouette. Within seconds, he was shot in the head. Then, a young man with a Molotov cocktail, wounded in the shoulder. In spite of the heavy gunfire, many of the students refused to get out of the way, disregarding their own safety. The toll in dead and injured was horrendous. The streets of Beijing splattered with blood. People used bicycles, pedicabs, whatever they could find to carry away the casualties. There were reports that rescuers trying to save some of the wounded were deliberately fired on by soldiers. Ambulance drivers braved the gunfire to rush the wounded to hospitals. Beijing hospitals were swamped. One doctor estimated the number of dead at 500 based on a telephone survey he took among his fellow doctors at other emergency rooms. The doctor said, my government has gone mad. As dawn broke, there were still carrying away the casualties, and word had spread throughout Beijing about the slaughter in Tiananmen Square, about the cold-bloodedness of the leaders who are supposed to represent the will of the people. Helicopters were landing in the square, carrying away the bodies left there. There were rumors that the army was cremating the victims as fast as it could, to disguise the extent of the carnage. 50 tanks were driven into position in the square, turning the symbolic center of Chinese communism into an armed camp. Chinese television Sunday night showed the end of another symbol, the 33-foot-tall figure resembling the Statue of Liberty that the students had constructed. According to the report, there had been some deaths in the square, but the, the government deemed its action necessary to save lives and property. One official government report characterized the massacre as a glorious victory over counter-revolutionary turmoil. But hardly anyone in this city thinks there's much glory in shooting down unarmed civilians. George Lewis, NBC News, Beijing. NBC's Arthur Kent is a cameraman as well as a correspondent. He was in the middle of the square when the troops moved in, and tonight he has this first-person account of what it was like. For weeks, Tiananmen Square had been an exciting place, a daring place. An authoritarian government was challenged in its own front yard. The mood was hopeful, even festive. All that changed yesterday afternoon. Armed troops approached from Beijing suburbs, emerged from hiding just next door. By nightfall, anxiety turned to fear. The battle began on Chang'an, the avenue of heavenly peace. For nearly two long hours, students threw stones, burned barricades. The soldiers answered with their rifles and rolled steadily on. For Tiananmen. Take care of you! Take care of yourself! For a reporter with a camera, some good advice from an underdog. The movement for democratic reform is on the run. The barricades look impressive, but the students fall back, taking heavy casualties. An unexpected prize, an army APC lost, then cornered. The campaigners for democracy have become a mob fighting for its life. The army driver hasn't a chance. The students are losing each step of the way. Even the dead can't be moved quickly enough on the avenue of eternal peace. The army reaches the square. They pause, prepare for the next push. The chairman looks on and public order comes from the barrel of a gun. As most people panic, some keep their heads. Medical students turn their clinic into a mash unit. The troops are closing in. They ignore the gunfire and evacuate the dead and wounded. The army begins to encircle the square. The battle of wills between the students and hardline leaders is decided. At the hero's monument, silent despair. A blood-stained jacket becomes the movement's newest banner. 
The students end it as they began, sitting down. The order goes on the loudspeaker. It's no use to resist. There is one place left to turn, to each other. Today, it's still not clear how many of the young people I left on that monument got out alive. But we are getting more reports of killings committed by government troops after the square was in their hands. Tom? Arthur, did the students realize the extent of the danger that they were in when the troops began to fire? I don't think so. Even the day before this occurred, there was, there was a mood in the square of uncertainty that this occupation could go on for some time. Certainly, the students had no idea that the government would take this most harshest of uh, steps against them. And you, you didn't see, even, even after nightfall, even when it was obvious that troops were moving in, students anxiously preparing any kind of weapons for, for self-defense beyond those few students who were, of course, packing Molotov cocktails and getting, getting ready for the worst. There have been reports as well that the students took some military men hostage and took some of their equipment as well. Have you seen that? Yes, when I was leaving the square last night, I saw a busload of very dejected-looking uh, soldiers who had been taken captive by the students. And, of course, the students, having left their friends back on the monument, uh, squarely in the sights of the advancing troops, had no intention of letting them go anytime soon. All right, thank you very much, Arthur Kent from NBC News, who is in uh, Beijing tonight. By the way, two CBS journalists, Richard Roth and Derek Williams, who was his cameraman, were arrested last night by troops and held in detention out of sight of CBS for too long a period of time. We're happy to report today they were released and they are in good health, although Richard Roth did suffer some cuts and a black eye. There are continuing signs of rebellion within the Chinese government. The most stunning example came in a Radio Beijing English language broadcast in which the announcer condemned the blood path, bloodbath, which he said killed thousands of people. Listen carefully now, for the broadcast is not perfect. This is Radio Beijing. A most tragic event happened in the Chinese capital, Beijing. Thousands of people, most of them innocent civilians, were killed by fully armed soldiers when they forced their way into the city. Among the killed are our colleagues at Radio Beijing. The soldiers were riding on armored vehicles. Thousands of local residents and students who tried to block their way. When army convoys made a breakthrough, soldiers continued to spray their bullets indiscriminately at crowds in the street. Radio Beijing English Department deeply mourns those died in a tragic incident and appeals to all its listeners to join our protest for the gross violation of human rights and for the most barbarous suppression of the people. The announcer who delivered that report was abruptly replaced by another who held to the party line. Someone who has been monitoring all of this and is devastated by what she is seeing and hearing from her friends in Beijing is Lu Bai Fong, who was raised in Beijing, came to the United States for her education. She is an expert on the Chinese student movement. She has just returned from her most recent trip to Beijing, and she is in San Francisco tonight. Lu Bai Fong, did you expect to see this happen? No, not on this magnitude. Um, people died are all young people, students, and intellectuals. They're my friends, Tom, you must know a lot of them too, when you were there in 87. And a lot of them were educated here. And a lot of American business mentors, when they go to China, they must have met a lot of them too. So they are dying. And then they were so honorable and peaceful and, and with belief for so long and for three or four or five weeks they were there and what they wanted were really a minimal democracy simple to meet their demands the government didn't and what they had met with was bullets in their face Lou, how and could this how could this happen because many of these are the children of the elite of china after all people who have positions of authority within the chinese government and yet they're shot down on the orders of the chinese government yes this is the government calls themselves the people's government and they call themselves People's Army, and they're shooting their own people. And they're shooting people who are rescuing the wounded. And they're shooting people in the hospitals because they're trying to organize some blood drive. And, and they're just 
I don't know. I don't know what these people are thinking about. Deng Xiaoping and old guards, they went on the long march. What did they want? Did they just, they, they suffered too when they were young. And they, now they just shoot their own people. That's what they were fighting for. Mao Zedong said that power comes from the barrel of a gun. That was demonstrated last night by the old guard, as you have described them in China. Students have no guns, really. Can they, no. can they continue their protests? Can this demonstration for democracy go on in China under these circumstances? Yes, I think so. I think young people are determined, and they know the world is changing. China is reforming. People are really, after the reform, they looked outside, they opened up, and they know China has to go on to make progress. They can't be just isolated little kingdom there anymore. And, and the Chinese communists who had fought for freedom, fought for people, um, now that they're just become fossilized in their thinking, you and they're not... Lu Bai Fong, you have adapted so well uh, between the two worlds, the West and the East. You've moved easily between this country and China. Will you ever be the same after this weekend? No. No. I, I will not be. And I think all the Chinese people, young or old, will not be the same after this. And they believe in, in progress, in change in democracy, human rights, and I think that American people should um, support them, morally support them, and I think all people in the world who believe in democracy, human rights, should stand up to this brutality of the Chinese government and support the movement. Lu Bai Fong. Thank you very much for being with us tonight. I know that this has not been an easy exercise for you. It's been indeed very painful. Thank you. President Bush is back in the White House after a weekend in Maine. We'll have a report on his reaction and a discussion of the consequences for the United States and the Soviets right after this. Every year, the hungry receive billions of pounds of food, yet millions still die of hunger and malnutrition. Obviously, giving food isn't enough. People also need the skills and equipment to feed themselves. So at CARE, we don't just give someone a meal. We keep that meal from being the last. CARE. We're helping people learn to live without us. You gotta be cool on the inside, too. President Bush returned to Washington from Kennebunkport, Maine, late this afternoon to confront calls for a harsher response from this country to that crackdown in China. While deploring the violence, the administration does not want to do anything that would close the doors on Chinese-American relations, however. NBC's John Dancy is standing by at the State Department tonight. John, what is the official United States line this evening from the administration? Tom, the United States is preparing, however, to take another step to show its distress at the way the leaders of China have handled things. You'll recall that yesterday, President Bush issued a statement deploring the killings. Well, that statement was roundly condemned here in Washington as being too little in the face of the massacre. So now, the president is looking at doing more. President Bush returned to confront a clamor for a stiffer U.S. response to the massacres in China. Bush will shortly get from Secretary of State James Baker a list of options. It was prepared on a frantic weekend of work by an interagency task force chaired by the State Department. The U.S. Embassy in Beijing took part in the planning. Pressure is growing on Capitol Hill for the U.S. to cut off military aid to China. That pressure is being led by North Carolina Senator Jesse Helms and New York Congressman Stephen Solars. We never should have gotten in the business of supplying arms to any communist government. 
I certainly hope the administration will undertake to cut off additional arms sales on their own, but if they don't, I have absolutely no doubt that there will be strong bipartisan support in the Congress for legislation to terminate a continued military relationship between our two governments. Over the past 10 years, the U.S. has built an intricate web of relationships with China. American businessmen have been flocking to China. So far, American companies have invested $3.4 billion in the country. Then, there is the military relationship. U.S. military aid to China is growing. The U.S., for example, is scheduled to supply $700 million worth of aviation electronics for a new Chinese fighter plane. Because of the improving relationship, the Chinese allowed the U.S. to set up monitoring stations to check up on Soviet missile tests. A cutoff of aid could affect those stations. Secretary of State Baker and President Bush believe aid to China draws the U.S. and China closer together. Thus, the reluctance to speak out strongly, even in the face of the massacre. But clearly the pressure on the United States to do something more, the administration to do and say something more, is growing. That's the reason the State Department and other agencies have spent this weekend preparing the list of options, Tom. Thank you, John Dancy. We'll ask you to stand by there throughout the evening. What about the Chinese leadership? Although it is impossible to know exactly what is going on within that inner circle, it is clear that the hardliners are calling the shots. Apparently, that includes 81-year-old Deng Xiaoping, who until recently was widely regarded as a heroic figure, the man who saved China from economic death with his reforms. Deng was with Mao on the Long March. He was twice purged from power, but he always came back. Despite recent speculation he would retire, it appears Deng, a man who cherishes stability and order, stayed too long. His protege is Premier Li Peng, 61 a hardliner who met with the students and demanded they end what he called anarchy. Lee was raised by the late Zhou Enlai. He has not been an enthusiastic supporter of China's recent economic reforms. Someone we have not seen or heard from in recent days is Zhao Ziyang, the more moderate general secretary of the Communist Party. He objected to the imposition of martial law, and now he may be in grave danger. Joining us now are two China experts who have helped guide us through the turmoil of the last few weeks. Winston Lord, who's the former U.S. ambassador to China, who just left that post this spring. He's in Washington tonight. Orville Schell is a China scholar. He joins us now from San Francisco. Let's begin with you, Mr. Ambassador, if we can. If the United States is to step up the pressure on the Chinese, either rhetorically or in other ways, will it make any difference to the leadership in your judgment? In the short run, no. They're more concerned now with reasserting their authority and cracking down on the unrest. Uh, and I come at this issue as someone who's worked hard for Sino-American relations for 20 years. Nevertheless, and I see the long-term stakes we have geopolitically and economically, which we have to preserve. But having said that, given what we've seen this weekend, we obviously have to take some steps, rhetorical and otherwise. What would you recommend if you were still in your post in Beijing? First, let me say, I think so far the administration's done all that could be expected. I think they've handled it about correctly. Secondly, I would like to see them, if possible, work with the Congress. This may be difficult, but a united position on this vis-a-vis -vis the Chinese would have more impact. This will require some of the congressmen and senators to be a little bit less aggressive than they'd like, and the administration probably to do a little bit more than it would like. The foreign minister of China is coming in a week. That'll be the first opportunity to directly convey our concerns, and I think he should meet not only with the administration, but with Congress, and with the Chinese community here, get the full brunt of the anger at what has happened. Let's go to uh, San Francisco now, to Orville Schell. It was not so long ago, uh, Mr. Schell, that you thought that maybe the moderates could win with all of this, that it would bring down the hardliners. Now, just exactly the opposite has changed. Ultimately, is this for the long run, in your judgment? Well, I think the only salvation of China still is the moderates, uh, Zhao Ziyang, the former party chief. I think there's absolutely no hope for the uh, current uh, regimen of, of hardliners. They have no moral credibility. I would also uh, express some concern over the moral credibility of our own country. I think we've been running along behind the cart rather than leading it, and I think it would behoove us to make some strong statement in defense of democracy in China, lest we lose the next generation of Chinese leadership, who, after all, are looking to America uh, for leadership, for guidance, and now, indeed, for support, uh, more than simply deploring the situation, 
uh, I would hope that the president would uh, announce some very stiff measures, such as the uh, retracting the most favored nation status of China, which gives them uh, trade benefits, which he can do unilaterally overnight. Something but, like that would be highly symbolic and most welcome, I would say. Mr. Shell, it does appear, however, that there is continuing chaos at the top in China as well. Is it not important to maintain some lines of communication during all of this? I think the question is uh, communication with who? I'd be very curious to know just who our government is now communicating with and whoever that may be, whether those people actually still control, hold effective reins of power in their hands. And if in the next week, if as we suspect there may be a general strike, much less riots, sabotage, things of that nature, whether the government will be worth speaking to at all. And Winston Lord, back in Washington, what's your judgment about the uh, possibility that Zhao Ziyang will come back and that the moderates, in fact, can have an opportunity to reclaim power in what can only be described as a situation bordering on anarchy if it's not pure anarchy at the moment. Well, stranger things have happened. Deng Xiaoping himself came back two or three times from oblivion. You have a very chaotic and fluid situation. The number one guy, Deng, is presumably quite sick. The party secretary is probably going to be purged along with his allies. The head of the government, Li Peng, is detested by the people, and I agree with Orville Schell, this regime has lost all more credibility. There's divisions in the Politburo, there's divisions in the army. I think the hardliners probably can hang on for the near term, but they've lost the mandate of heaven, and sooner or later the moderates, whether it's Zhao or someone else, I believe will come back. All right, thank you very much, uh, former Ambassador Winston Lord and Orville Schell, who is the author of a book called This Goes in Democracy. He's an expert on the dissident movement in China. From the Soviet Union tonight, TASS reporting deaths and injuries in Beijing without reaction from the Soviet leadership. Without doubt, the Soviets are concerned by the crackdown. Less than three weeks ago, Soviet leader Gorbachev was meeting with Deng Xiaoping, healing relations with China after a 30-year split. He was embraced by many Chinese people. He even took time to pose with a Chinese soldier. In fact, he was hailed as a hero of democracy, Mikhail Gorbachev, when he was visiting in Beijing. With him there at the time was NBC's Moscow correspondent Bob Abernathy, who is standing by with us tonight. Do you think that the Soviets, Bob, are reacting uh, to these, uh, or rather failing to react to these violent protests because they're worried that something similar may happen in the Soviet Union, that there may be a kind of a populist backlash? I don't, I don't think so. I think uh, what's happening is that they are sticking to a position that they've had for a long time, that uh, they considered the, uh, the students in Tiananmen Square an internal matter for the Chinese. Uh, I, they consider the uh, repression of the students an internal matter for the Chinese. Um, Mr. Gorbachev is just back from a visit to China to try to heal the rift, the 30-year rift that began because of Chinese resentment over Moscow's trying to tell Beijing how to run its affairs. The Soviets do not want to revive that uh, hostility. But, Bob, there is now instability, plainly, in the streets of Beijing, and we uh, can only determine that there is a good deal of chaos in the leadership as well. Do you think that Gorbachev might tighten things up on the Sino-Soviet border just because there is that instability there and put some of those military units back in place? Well, perhaps. Uh, and people say, well, what about the reform movement in the Soviet Union? Uh, will the repression in China cool it off here? Uh, my feeling is not. Uh, the, 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 uh, the desire for reforms here is so great. The people, so many people, want things to change uh, that uh, I, I think that, uh, that movement will continue very strong. All right, thanks very much, Bob Abernathy, who's in Moscow tonight. From much of the rest of the world, condemnation. Britain's Prime Minister Thatcher expressed deep shock at the indiscriminate shooting of unarmed people. French President Mitterrand said that any government that resorts to firing on its young people has, in his words, no future. And Pope John Paul expressed hope that these deaths may serve to bring about new life to what he called that great and beloved country. In a moment, we'll have late word on what is happening in Beijing and other Chinese cities. The Chinese in America make their protest heard, and we'll be hearing from a prominent U.S. senator on all of this. Next, Mallory gives the family ties bare backs of fashion. We didn't have clothes. We'd be naked. With elegance and sophistication. If your panty line is showing, a little bell goes up. Then an all-new day by day, Ross has big plans. Dream on, Pee-wee. For a new image. A jaded gigolo with the morals of a great. Coming up. Hey, you don't want to eat that.
and empty high calorie food, you're going to run the risk of high cholesterol and increase your risk of heart attack. Instead, eat the healthy stuff. The pay Five million women suffer from premature baldness. So if you're finding more hair in the comb, don't be alarmed. You're not alone. Oh, man, you're going to need the umbrella for the next five days. Al Roker. Showers and thunderstorms are going to have you worrying about rust instead of the tan. No one covers New York like News 4 New York. Singer Donna Summer is our guest Monday on Live at 5. The sun is now higher in the sky on this Monday morning in Beijing, and on a normal day, the people of that city of 10 million people would be heading for work, most of them on bicycle. But this is not a normal day. It is a memorably tragic day for the people of Beijing and for freedom-loving people everywhere. NBC's Keith Miller is in Beijing. He's back with us now for an update on what he is seeing from his vantage point. Keith, what is going on in the square at this hour? Well, the situation is far from settled, Tom. Uh, it is sort of like the town square is being occupied by the troops, but Main Street is in the hands of the people. All along the avenue, for well over a mile, tens of thousands of people have come out from their homes. They're not going to their offices. They're coming out here to inspect the damage, to see what's happened, and to assess what they should do next. It is unsettled, it is tense, as you said, so tragic. People are staying away from the main barricades erected by the army. There are still thousands of troops in the square. It is a face-off, but the people here are growing in numbers, and they're growing volatile. Uh, Keith, a few moments ago, you described for us a shooting that occurred on the edge of Tiananmen Square when some young people got too close to the troops. Any repeat of that kind of action? No, there's been no gunfire in the last, well, almost for an hour now, but... Uh, the, the troops are armed with AK-47s. They have shown their uh, ability and determination to hold the square at all costs. And so people are being a little bit cautious about going too close to them. But the crowds, as I said, are building now. They're coming out into the street and forming large groups, and their voices are getting louder and louder. It is very tense out here at the moment. All right, Keith, we'll continue to ask you to stand by there. Beijing, of course, was not the only city in which the students were demonstrating for democracy these past several weeks. Tonight, there are reports of new protests, not for anything, but against the crackdown in many of China's other major cities. In Nanjing, students urged a general strike. In Shanghai, which is China's largest city, tens of thousands of students are blocking the streets, disrupting traffic, vowing to create chaos in Shanghai, that port city. NBC's Jim Maceda is in Shanghai tonight. Tom, the Tiananmen Square massacre has sent shockwaves uh, throughout the nation, but those waves are moving slowly as official news organs continue to mask the incident. Uh, in China's industrial center here in Shanghai, it's the public's ignorance of the gravity of what has happened in Beijing that remains the students' biggest obstacle in keeping their pro-democracy movement alive. Student leaders in Shanghai spread word of the killings to a disbelieving public. By midday, the truth about what had happened was sinking in. It is incredible. If they send in the troops here, we're not afraid to face them. Reaction in the nation's biggest city was sporadic. Main access roads were blocked by buses commandeered by the students. There were massive traffic jams. Whole sections of the city were brought to a halt. Thousands of residents and workers turned out in support of the pro-democracy movement and to learn more of what had happened in Beijing. The military attacks took protesters here completely by surprise. Shocked, really shocked very much and uh, feel disappointed and uh, some of us cried. Most students had left Shanghai for the countryside where they planned to distribute flyers and bring news of their movement to the villagers. Now they've been called back to regroup and rethink their strategy. Most of Shanghai today was business as usual. People here seem more concerned about shopping than protesting. A pocket of students did manage to capture a bus in the financial district, but a rainstorm spoiled the victory. On Shanghai's campuses, students listened to translated newscasts from Western media, trying to understand the carnage a thousand miles away. The students say there'll be more civil disobedience despite the risk of a military clampdown. Yet few deny that today marks a turning point in their struggle for reform. Well, it's now morning time in Shanghai, and uh, students have come out here once again in force. 
Uh, hundreds of buses and taxis have been commandeered by the protesters, and they block traffic all over the capital. Uh, metal barricades are up across main intersections. Uh, it seems like the students are trying to keep workers from coming to work in the city, hoping thus to create some kind of economic crisis here for the government. Tom? Thank you very much. In Meseda tonight in Shanghai, a young man from Shanghai, one of an estimated 40,000 Chinese studying at American University, said today of his homeland, I don't think there's any hope at this moment. He and thousands of others across the United States and a dozen cities expressed their sorrow and their anger. NBC's Robert Hager has been keeping track of them. In San Francisco, 3,000 Chinese students staged an angry protest outside the Chinese consulate. They demanded the current government resign. They called for a general strike in China, and they wept for the dead. In New York, another angry crowd outside another Chinese consulate. They, they just hit people. They, they killed so many people. I feel very angry about our, our government. You can't imagine the people's government killed their own people. In Los Angeles, a coffin commemorating the dead carried through the streets and more tears. In Washington, the Chinese embassy drew a crowd of thousands of protesters shouting slogans and bearing this letter to Chinese leadership, saying the crowd had gathered to cry for our people, to mourn the dead, and to deplore the use of troops in Tiananmen Square. The group blocked the front of the embassy building. A wreath memorializing the dead was carried to the front door. If you're Chinese, come join us, the crowd shouted. Ambassador Han Shi, come down, this man said. But no one came to the door. No one dared accept the wreath. The slogans grew tougher. We will support the students. Down with communism. The people will win. The students will win. In Boston, almost 500 students gathered to hear the story of the awful night. Finally, those armored trucks and tanks just rolled over those more than a thousand people lying on ground, crushed them, and then they put gasoline on those bodies and set it to fire. And finally, the protesters say their demonstrations here will continue. Robert Hager, NBC News, reporting. Liang Heng is a Chinese scholar. He's the publisher of the magazine Chinese Intellectual, the author of The Son of the Revolution, and he's with us now. He was raised in China. You have been on the telephone to your friends who are the intellectuals of China. By that, we mean college-educated, people who are concerned about education and so on. What are they telling you? Are they frightened at this point? Um, since the beginning of the students' demonstration, I have been calling my friends in Beijing almost every day. This weekend, I called my friend who didn't sleep all night. He told me the intellectuals who have supported the students' demonstration on the one hand are very, very angry and painful. On the other, are very scared of being arrested. They told me now the intellectuals couldn't do anything. That is can the movement continue without the intellectuals? Can the students carry on on their own? Sometimes, you know, the young people can be impetuous, but without the great middle class and the intellectuals, can this movement go on? Um, no, the question is that now in China, as long as uh, the old revolutionary are in power, there's a little opportunity for China to advance because these old revolutionaries don't know how to deal with the new challenge brought by, by the re economic reform and opening to the outside, of, outside world. So this that is why this old revolutionary are very scared of any challenge to their authority and cannot tolerate any criticism. That is why they finally, uh, they have finally ordered the army to shoot the peaceful, uh, 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 innocent people and students. Have you lost friends? Yes, my friend told me uh, some friends of mine are killed or arrested. 
you went through the Cultural Revolution. You were a member of the Red Guard until you saw the light, as you have described it in your book, Son of the Revolution. How do you compare with what is going on now with what happened then? Twenty years ago, in 1969, I, as a little boy in my hometown in China, saw many people died in the street. They were used by Chairman Mao and died for Chairman Mao's Cultural Revolution. But this time, I think it's totally different. It is a confrontation between the government and the people. The Chinese government lets its army fire at its own people. So I believe after this crackdown, Chinese people have completely lost their confidence in their own government. Meng Heng, thanks very much for being with us tonight. The Thank author you. of The Chinese Intellectual. Nowhere is the turmoil of China being watched more closely or with more urgency than in Hong Kong, and that's an island colony that will come under Beijing's control in less than 10 years now. It's one of the economic forces of this world. Before China opened its doors to the West, Hong Kong was the listening post for what was going on behind the bamboo curtain, as we called it in those days. NBC's Charles McLean is in Hong Kong tonight. He reports that the people there are angry and hurt and concerned by what they are seeing. For the third Sunday in a row, the people of Hong Kong turned out to show their support for the students in Beijing. Hundreds of thousands assembled in a downtown stadium to voice their outrage and share their grief. They wore black and white, the traditional colors of mourning in the West and the East. Speakers denounced the Chinese leadership and called on the citizens of Hong Kong to observe a general strike on Wednesday to take their savings out of Chinese banks and to continue their protest against the crackdown in Beijing. The British colony of Hong Kong will formally become a part of China in 1997. So for the people here, the battle for democracy in Beijing is a fight for their own future as well. Today's Beijing will be tomorrow's Hong Kong. I mean, the Hong Kong in future. So all Hong Kong people know what will happen. Just the threat of instability in China has caused the Hong Kong stock market to slide in recent weeks. One stockbroker said, I don't want to predict the downside now. But for most people here, the bloodbath in Beijing was not a pocketbook issue. At a makeshift memorial on a downtown street, the people paid their respects. Brother had turned on brother in their homeland. They mourned for the present and the future. Charles McLean, NBC News, Hong Kong. Trade is a big factor between the United States and China. Last year, it was an estimated $13 billion. This year, it was expected to be even greater because no one knows whether this brutal crackdown might dampen the enthusiasm of American business. We want to examine that tonight with, among others, Richard Holbrook, who is the former Assistant Secretary of State for Far Eastern Affairs, now an investment banker. And with us from Indianapolis tonight is a member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, Senator Richard Lugar. We have some problem with the pictures there, Senator, but we'll uh, ask you just to stand by for a moment. Let's begin with you, Mr. Holbrook. You've been on the telephone to Hong Kong tonight. Do you think that there will be pressure on the British to try to break the agreement with the Chinese to turn over Hong Kong? There will be pressure on the British. I doubt the British will do a thing. They've washed their hands of Hong Kong. My friends and colleagues in Hong Kong tell me that the key word in Hong Kong tonight is not fear, but anger. I think the stock market, which will open in about two hours, is going to see a five or six hundred point drop today. Among other things, you advise people about what they ought to do with their money in China. Tonight, can you look an American businessman in the eye and say, yes, I think there's a future there for American business? I, if a businessman asked me tonight if he should invest in China, I would say the following. First, this is an enormous human tragedy, and that issue transcends economic and business factors, and we should recognize that and think about that first. Secondly, if he's thinking about a new business venture, the answer is obvious. Don't do a thing. If he's already in China, and as you've just pointed out, there's a lot of business in China right now, the answer right now is stand pat, wait, see what happens. I'd say one last thing, Tom. If I was asked for a personal view based on nothing but intuition and faith, I would say that today's winners, the hardliners, will be within a year the losers. I do not think they can hold on, and I agree there with Ambassador Lord. Uh, Senator Luger in Indianapolis, you've been listening to all of this. Do you think that the United States government, as a matter of policy, ought to crack down in terms of trade and economic restrictions as a result of what's happened? Well, I think the president probably ought to... The regime is sealed in space. The students are going to prevail. I have a long-time relationship with China. I recognize that. Seems to me in the... In the 
Well, we apologize, Senator Luger. That's just not fair to you. We can get a picture from Beijing, but we cannot get one from Indianapolis tonight for a whole variety of reasons. So we feel bad about that. I can tell you, however, I think fairly characterized what the senator has been saying today. He had urged the administration earlier to be harder on uh, the condemnation of what has been going on there. At the same time, Senator Luger has said that he believes that the Chinese student movement will continue as long as there are fax machines. And that's a reference to the fact that uh, fax machines have been used between this country and Beijing so that the students here can communicate with the students there. It really is a remarkable testament both to their will and to modern technology. I'll be back in a moment. John Chancellor will be with me as well. He has some thoughts on what's happening in China, and then we'll take a look back on this remarkable week of the People's Revolution. Hello, I'm Gregory Peck. Being a host family for an international high school student can be a very rewarding experience. The American Intercultural Student Exchange is looking for families who'd like to have a student live with them for a school year. For further information, call 1-800-SIBLING. Thank you. You think staying in school is tough? I'll tell you what's tougher, not staying in school. As a high school graduate, you can look forward to a career, even college. But as a dropout, you can look forward to a life of low-paying jobs and rejection. The more you know how hard things are for dropouts, the more you realize that paying dues for a few years is a lot smarter than paying dues for a lifetime. <laughs> Joined now by my colleague, John Chancellor, the NBC News commentator. John, we've both been to China a number of times. We've watched with fascination this country over the past 15 years or so. What are your thoughts tonight after this weekend? Tom, just think what China has lost because of this, what I call the Saturday Night Massacre. China had come such a long way in the last few years. It had good relations with most of the world. It was developing ties of commerce and trade with other countries. Beijing was full of bankers and industrialists making deals. Tourism was flourishing. Chinese students were studying the technology of the future in dozens of foreign universities. China was still poor, but the future looked good. Deng Xiaoping had become an international symbol of a new, pragmatic China. He was beginning to tap into the enormous store of competitive energy and intelligence that the Chinese people represent. And now we're told he's the man who ordered the troops into Tiananmen Square. It's difficult tonight to calculate the extent of the damage to China's interests. China had begun attracting a new kind of tourism, the mom-and-pop package tour kind of tourism. That lucrative trade depends on a guarantee of safe streets, something Beijing isn't noted for this weekend. And what are bankers in Zurich or London thinking tonight about a Chinese government that first dithered and delayed for seven weeks while the people were in the streets and then overreacted with a bloodbath? Foreign governments are now going to have to think twice about bridges of friendship or cultural exchanges with a regime that has this much blood on its hands. Perhaps most damaging of all is the effect of the bloodshed on China's students and intellectuals at home and abroad. Those young people are China's future and what they must think tonight. Not too many years ago, China was in the grip of the great cultural revolution, a mindless tyranny of the left, which ruined its reputation. Is China now lurching into a tyranny of the right? Let's hope not, but we don't know. What we do know is that the reputation of this great country has been ruined again, Tom. John, do you think in the last 10 or 12 years that we've all been charmed in our hearts by the Chinese, while in our heads we knew that these were ruthless people really at the top? I think you still see two Chinas. We've seen on television in the last few days two quite different images about China. One was that tasteless caricature of the man with the Uncle Sam mask that the hardliners put on the streets, uh, attacking Uncle Sam and capitalism. The other image was this beautiful, tasteful statue that they erected in Tiananmen Square. Those are the two Chinas. I think in the end, we all hope that the people who made the statue are going to win and the people who put the Uncle Sam mask on that are going to lose, but I don't think it'll happen right away. Thanks very much for coming in, John. Well, China, as we have seen over this weekend, what we have seen is the hard heart of that dragon. And it is all the more stunning for Americans since for the past 15 years or so. In fact, we have been charmed by China, that ancient polite culture. The Middle Kingdom, the forbidden city, ruled by man under a mandate from heaven. 
it seems as if some parts of China never change. The sampans, the Yangtze, the little villages dirty and bubbling with life, and the faces. People who work harder than we can possibly imagine for very little money and the simplest of foods. Our images of China have changed in the last few weeks, but some parts of China seem not to change at all. Ageless, mysterious, it has survived a lot of history. The latest chapter began this spring with the death of a student favorite, Hua Yubong. Now the voices of the Chinese and NBC News correspondents. Hu's death touched off anti-government protests because many considered him an advocate of political reform. The press belongs to the people. It should tell, tell the people uh, about the truth. For the first time, Chinese journalists joined in a show of solidarity. We are forced to hunger strike to get democracy. A welcome ceremony for Gorbachev had to be moved to the airport from Tiananmen Square because of the student occupation of the square. Do you think that we will lose lives here? Yeah, uh, that's... The thought that young people are risking their lives for democracy has created a huge groundswell of support for the students. In Beijing and elsewhere, a million Chinese were on the streets. Today, it was like a holiday celebration, and Beijing was one big parade. Everyone wanted to take part. Farmers, cooks, taxi drivers, schoolgirls singing the national anthem. What worries Chinese officials is how that support is spreading around the country. Canton, Nanking, Xi'an protesters in at least 20 cities. Tonight in Shanghai, they sat in the rain with a model of the Statue of Liberty. This young man shouted, long live the people. People yearning to breathe free. Late at night, Chinese television broke into regular programming to carry an announcement by Premier Lei Peng that the government was imposing what appeared to be martial law in Beijing. Before dawn, Zhao, accompanied by Premier Li, went to the square to visit the students. He boarded a bus where some of those involved in the hunger strike had sought shelter from a rainstorm. He pleaded with the students to end their fast and indicated he was sympathetic to their demands for more democracy in China. It was the second day of martial law, but government troops could not get to Beijing to enforce it. Tens of thousands of people swarmed over troop convoys in a scene reminiscent of the People Power Revolution in the Philippines. Diplomatic sources tell NBC News they believe the Chinese government is waging a war of attrition against the students, letting fatigue and the heat take their toll as the occupation of Tiananmen Square concludes its second week. The number of students camped out has declined from about 50,000 a few nights ago to about 10,000 tonight. So it won't be of much use to stay on, but we, um, we don't like to retreat because we have made so much effort. State-run television showed pictures of army troops training on the outskirts of Beijing. The troops were brought here last week to impose martial law, but haven't been used against student demonstrations. Erecting a replica of the Statue of Liberty in the symbolic center of communist China has inflamed hardliners even further. I think people support us. Police cannot injure us. They cannot stop us. Police cannot injure us, a prophecy that, alas, turned out to be true. And Keith Miller is reporting from Tiananmen Square now Monday in Beijing that there is sporadic gunfire once again and some loudspeaker announcements, but all that means we don't know. So it is Monday, a new day in China in so many ways. And somewhere in Beijing at this hour, the aging leadership is likely determining what to do next, trying to determine the consequences of what it has done so far. It has driven the students and other demonstrators from the square, but at what price? Has this brutal attack so enraged the nation a full-scale civil war now is imminent? How long can these cold-blooded rulers hold back the winds of freedom sweeping the rest of the world? They may have won the day and lost their nation. I'm Tom Brokaw.
We'll have continuing reports on the situation in China on this NBC station and extensive coverage beginning tomorrow morning with today. I'll see you tomorrow night on NBC Nightly News.